Hello, and welcome to the 12th and final episode of Among the Ancients with Emily Wilson, a podcast series from the London Review of Books. I'm Thomas Jones, an editor at the LRB. Emily Wilson is Professor of Classical Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Hello, Emily, and thank you very much for joining me. Hello, Tom. In previous episodes, we've often talked, Emily, about how little we know about the lives of these ancient Greek and Roman writers. But in Seneca's case, for once, we actually know quite a lot, don't we? We know quite a lot, especially about the later years of Seneca's life, because he was so much a public figure, a political figure, and also because we have such a huge amount of his oeuvre, and he wrote in prose as well as the verse dramas that we'll focus on today. And also a lot of, a lot of his writings are about um, how to live. And so we, so we know both about, about his biography and also about his sort of theory of life, which may or may not fit the bio, biographical um, data. And so his, his father was Seneca the Elder, who we may have mentioned when yes. talking about Ovid. I think we mentioned maybe because he refers to Ovid. So Seneca the Elder left these discussions of celebrity orators, of um, people who were amazing at declamation and producing these controversiae and suasoriae, the set-piece um, rhetorical debaters. And Seneca the Elder, Seneca's dad, was obsessed with that genre of of performance art and wrote these uh, accounts of the, the famous orators of his youth. And, and sent his son off to, to oratory school. To oratory school, exactly, to rhetoric school. Yes, where, where, he, where of course he did extremely well. And um, the, the influence of rhetoric, the, the influence of rhetoric school, of course, is all over Seneca's work, both the first and the, and the prose. So Seneca, the, um, the elder, had three sons and wanted all of them to be both great in rhetoric and great in politics. So Seneca was born in Spain, so in the provinces, far away from Rome. But they came, came to Rome and got educated with the, the elite of the rhetorical schools of Rome. Yeah, and, and, and also his, when he was born, he was born, he's sort of about the same age as Jesus, but born at the other end. Roughly the same age as Jesus, yes. So like Jesus, he didn't actually, wasn't actually born in the year dot, um, but probably either one or four CE, depending on how we interpret references to him being a little kid. So very much a, a child of the, of the established empire. Child of the empire, yes. So we've talked, we've talked with the previous Roman authors that we've talked about, about the transition from the Republic to the empire. Seneca's life was all entirely lived under the Roman empire. So he was a little kid under Augustus and then a young man under Tiberius. And then maybe we'll get into his perhaps problematic relationships with Caligula, Claudius, and then ultimately Nero. Yeah, well, maybe we could even talk about those strays away. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yes. So Seneca, um, we know that in his youth, he studied philosophy. Um, he, he was late coming to a political career, and he seems to have spent 10 years recovering from a mysterious illness in Egypt and perhaps also hiding from the political maelstrom of Rome. But then once he did come back to Rome, he very, very quickly entered the centres of power and seems to have become very, very close to people in the imperial court, including the women in the imperial court. And he um, was accused of adultery with one of the sisters of Caligula. And was almost sentenced to death, but then was instead, um, we're told thanks to the um, merciful intervention of Claudius, the emperor, his sentence was transmuted to, um, to exile. So he spent eight years of his life during, during the 40s CE in exile on Corsica. And then he was recalled... By Nero? It was before that. It was, it was thanks to Nero's mom, Agrippina. Um, so Agrippina was looking for a tutor for her son, the future emperor, teenage Nero. And Seneca had clearly started his literary career by then. He'd certainly written several um, rhetorical set-piece consolations. So prose works comforting famous or prominent people for their grief for lost loved ones, including a sort of set piece one in which he's comforting his mother for her, for her loss of himself during the <laughs> exile. So showing this sort of ability to take a very traditional um, literary form and put an extraordinary spin on it. Um, so he, he demonstrated its extraordinary literary ability. He may also have started writing the tragedies during exile. So there's a lot, lot of debate about when exactly the tragedies were written. But for Based on whatever the early work of Seneca was, um, Agrippina was aware of Seneca and aware that he would be make, make for a great 
literary tutor for her, for her ambitious son, Nero, who might well, if, as, as long as the right people got out of the way, become the next emperor. And was she also looking for a Stoic philosopher to teach, to teach Nero how to be a good <laughs> how man? How to be a <laughs> restrained and temperate man. I mean, we're told that he, that he was not hired under that premise. He was hired as a teacher of rhetoric, not as a teacher of philosophy. Um, so, of course, one can speculate about whether he tried to teach Nero some Stoicism, which maybe didn't stick very well. Um, but that, that's, as far as we can tell, that wasn't what Agrippina was in the market for. She, was, she wanted to make her son able to be a great public figure who could give wonderful public speeches. And then once, once Nero did become emperor, Seneca was, for, at least for the first few years, one of the primary speech writers for, for Nero. So it's quite, quite possible that he advisor, was then yeah. and, and close political and personal advisor to Nero, along with Burrus, who was the head of the emperor's um, bodyguard team, the Praetorian Guard. And suppose is it the is it the first five years or so of Nero's reign? Yes, was supposed to be the gold, the golden years before it all <laughs> fell apart <laughs> with Nero. Yes, I yeah. mean there's a lot of I mean, there's a lot of debate about how golden were those years really, given um, given how many murders there, there clearly were, um, and how how much. Um, oppression in certain ways there were. But certainly we're told by the ancient historians that during the first five years of Nero's reign, when he was still, he, he, was, a teenager, he was still a teenager when he, became, when he acceded to the empire, he was relatively under the thumb of both Seneca, Burrus and his mother. But then after those five years, he sort of took, his, took, took the empire much more into his own hands and stopped listening to Seneca and Burrus at all. And then at a certain point that he says, or we think, or we're told that he wanted to retire? Yes. So we have, we have the most detailed account of all of that from Tacitus, who gives this um, wonderful sort of semi-satirical account of Seneca trying to retire and also trying to give back all the huge amounts of wealth and huge amounts of villas that he's been and handouts that he's been given in the service of Nero and Nero not letting him retire and saying, actually, you can't give any of that back. It's not how it works. You're going to stay here, stay here right where I can see you instead. And then he, so he, may, he seems to have made several attempts to retire and get out of the um, potentially dangerous and volatile situation of being um, the less, the relatively out of favour, ex, ex-favourite of the Emperor Nero. And then he fell very badly out of favour when he was accused of being one of the conspirators in the, in the Pisonian conspiracy, this. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so he, so he eventually had succeeded in, in, adopting at least semi-retirement and uh, for the last five years of his life or so, from about 60 CE on. But as you say, in 65 um, CE, he was accused of being one of the conspirators against Nero and um, was forced to kill himself. So he, he went through this elaborate um, suicide where he tried to drink hemlock and it didn't work and tried to slit his wrists and it didn't work and eventually had to get in a hot steam bath to, to let all the blood out because he was such a wizened old man. So he tried to have a, a sort of the, pr- the proper philosophical death, but it took him a while, um, which I think is also typical of just how difficult it was for Seneca to be a philosopher. Yeah, so, so that question of the, of the philosopher, because we have m- most of what we know, or a lot of what we know about Roman Stoicism comes from the writings of Seneca, or maybe about mm-hmm. Stoicism altogether. Yes, exactly. So Stoicism, like Epicureanism, was a um, Hellenistic philosophy, which was invented by somebody called Zeno, developed by somebody called Chrysippus. Um, but we don't have more than just sort of fragmentary bits of and summaries of the works of Zeno and Chrysippus, the Hellenistic um, Stoic philosophers. What we do have is this vol- the voluminous works of Seneca, which are very, very deeply influenced by Stoicism, even though Seneca also borrows from other philosophies, including Epicureanism. Um, So Stoicism was a philosophy like Epicureanism, which was a sort of total vision of the world. So we talked about, when we talked about Lucretius, about how Epicureanism was both an account of the universe and also an account of how you should live your life. And Stoicism was the same way. It was both an account of physics, logic, cosmology, theology, metaphysics, but then also how should you live your life. And the Stoic answer to how you should live your life is that you must be, you must live in accordance with nature or nature or the will of God, which are kind of the same thing. 
Um, and in order to do that, you have to um, prioritize the only thing that really matters, which is virtue or being a good person. And you must get rid of the passions which are based on false beliefs. And there are four primary categories of emotions based on, fo on false beliefs, which I think it matters for setting up the tragedies because the tragedies are all about these things. Um, so there's, um, there's triumph or, or false joy when you think something's going really well, but actually it's something that doesn't matter at all. There's grief. So you may think it matters that somebody's enslaving you or your child's being killed or somebody's breaking your legs or whatever it is that you think matters and you're upset about it. That doesn't matter. So you shouldn't have grief. Um, you may be terrified because you, something you think is bad is going to happen. Like your city may be, may be about to fall or somebody may, may be about to murder you or kill your children and feed them to you. Again, doesn't matter. So you shouldn't be afraid. Um, and then the final one is anger, one of the, which, which Seneca wrote a whole very long treatise about um, anger. It's one of the ones he's most interested in, where, of course, you're enraged because you think something, some kind of wrong has been done to you. Again, no wrong has been done to you as long as nobody has destroyed your virtue. Thanks for listening to this extract from Among the Ancients, a close reading series from the London Review of Books. To listen to the full episodes and all our other close reading series, Sign up to our Close Reading subscription. Go to lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description.